Um, I will speak in English, uh, and I would like to warmly thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, there's a rhetoric that says that um, democracy was invented in Greece. It is true that the notion of democracy was firstly discussed in ancient Athens. There's a problem with this kind of democracy. The democracy established in ancient Athens was a democracy accessible only by the privileged citizens of the capital city. Uh, the citizens who owned the right to have a citizenship. It was a democracy exclusive for immigrant and domestic slaves and for women. In this sense, we can say that our neoliberal national governments and the EU have today a perverse admiration of this model. So discussing about the crisis, the universal prescription of super austerity has proved not to be the means to cope with fiscal instability or the public debt problem. Austerity is the means to achieve the new European project of the neoliberal camp, what we call the Chinaization of labor relations and workers' rights the dissolution of public services, and the most violent redistribution of wealth in favor of the big capital that we have seen since the end of World War II. For these reasons, we believe in our analysis that this is not a confrontation or a war between nations, but it's a hardest European class war that our con the peoples of our continent have experienced since the fall of Nazism. But the neoliberals already know that they cannot achieve this Chinaization under a democratic environment. In order to achieve their aims, our national governments, together with the famous Troika, are attempting to impose the replacement of democratic rules, the violation of popular sovereignty, by a new type of what we call financial authoritarianism, or, in one word, austeritarianism. This new regime is not and cannot be based on social peace because of the extremely destructive social consequences that austerity programs have. This regime attempts to achieve social tolerance through spreading out fear, terror, and blackmailing campaigns orchestrated by the mainstream media in our countries, through the escalation of state repression, and through the violation of national constitutions, national and European legislation, even through the violation of the existing European treaties that our political opponents have imposed in the past. The Greek people were chosen to become the first guinea pigs in this laboratory of experimentation. Greece became the first experimentation field for the elaboration of this austeritarian project. I have to tell you that the first memorandum or loan agreement for Greece was never presented and voted in the Greek parliament. It was ratified through the signatures of the prime minister, the finance minister, and the president of the republic. And our government was back then was a social democratic one. At the same time, most of the austerity measures have been approved by our parliament through emergency procedures. Because every time they use the blackmail, we don't have more time. If we don't vote them today, they will kick us out of the euro, and so on and so forth. And they were ratified with simply absolute majority 
while the national constitution of Greece predicts that for strategic contracts, there must be an increased majority to approve them in the parliament. What are the social consequences of this version of austeritarianism? 1.5 million of unemployed people. We are the champions. The Spanish are no more the champions. 25% of, of the Greek population, one out of the four people you see in the street, are trying to survive under the poverty line. In Athens, there's an official counting of 25,000 homeless people. 70% 70, 70 of patients have insufficient monthly income to buy their medicine. 55.4% of patients do not follow their daily treatments. At the same time, in a few days, we will face a new austerity package of 13.5 billion euro of new cuts in public spending. This means salaries, pensions, public health, public education. And through this period, austeritarian democracy means in practical numbers that we have spent a total amount of 550 million of euro, which is the cost for the recapitalization of the private banking system of Greece. The salary of a newly hired teacher, which does not exist as a term because public schools did not hire anybody this year, is 660 euro while the new minimum wage in the pub private sector for workers up to 25 years of age is below 400 euro. At the same time, and I finish with the numbers, there was a report two days ago that stated, and this is the aim of austeritarian democracy, that the big Greek businesses had in the last two years of the memorandums an increase by 19% of their annual profits. Today, exactly the same austeritarianism is exercised in Portugal, in Spain, Italy, but also centrally in the European Union level through the fiscal pact, through the institutionalization of the iron rule of austerity and the plans for a centralized fiscal and budget control, of course, under the present relation of forces in Europe. This strategy of fear, combined with the structural connection of neoliberal capitalism with corruption, and also combined with the integration of racist and xenophobic rhetoric in the mainstream political discourse, by the previous governments, has deepened the crisis of political representation and boosted the emergence of neofascism in Greece. There's a theory that the appearance of the party of the Golden Dawn, which is actually not a party but a murderous neo-Nazi gang, their appearance in the parliament would make them integrate into the parliamentary democracy model we have in Greece. The truth and the historical experience has shown that when fascism engages itself, itself with the institutions, then fascism does not adopt democratic institutional ruling, but instead the institutions adopt themselves to the fascist authoritarianism. Our, government, our, our neoliberal governments, the former and the present government coalition, showed, understood that the guinea pig, the Greek people, are starting to react. So now they are using the dangerous theory of the two extremes. On one extreme is the neo-Nazis, the other extreme is the radical left and all the people who resist in the streets. But this dangerous theory of the two extremes has led to the attachment of the Greek government 
and the Greek police to the fascist version of the two extremes. I have to tell you that a few days ago, anti-fascist demonstrators who were arrested were tortured in the general administration building of the Greek police in Athens with the use of tasers, electroshock guns, and, other, with other, and with other forms of humiliation. These have been internationally denounced in The Guardian, and the answer of our government coalition was that they will sue The Guardian for uh, telling wide spreading of lies. Fortunately, as I told you, and I finish with this, the guinea pig, the Greek people reacted. In the last two years, we have organized about 13, 14 general strikes. I know that this is a strange number for Germany. <laughs> and last year, after the provocation by our Spanish brothers and sisters, we decided to follow their example and occupied the squares of the country transforming especially Syntagma Square, which is now an urban symbol of the social resistances in Greece, into a huge social laboratory of experimentation with new forms of public consultation, direct and indirect mixture of democracy, and the elaboration of an alternative program of the peoples coming from the peoples and not imposed by an avant-garde political party. All the activists of Syriza were in the squares and still are. But we didn't go there with our party flags. We were there as leftist militants with a specific set of values for our society and our life that tried to contaminate our brains with the ideas, the problems, and the fears of the ordinary people who participated in the, local, in the public assemblies in the squares by thousands and thousands, who resisted to the police repression in an unprecedented way that no organized left force has managed to do in the previous years. But for the positive side of the situation in Greece, I think I will have the chance to speak in the second round. Thanks. Okay, so we have to do something. And in order to do something, in order to do something, we need to answer very urgent questions. Our experience from Greece shows that the number one rule is that you don't answer to the wrong questions. So you don't answer the, the questions that the enemy puts. You create your own questions. Number one, what kind of society we want? How this society will function under a left government? Tomorrow, I hope. <laughs> Number two, how can we overcome the democratic deficit? How can people control the decision-making processes and fight against corruption and safeguard the justice system and try to elaborate deeper changes in the socio-economic model? The key element of this discussion, not only in the national level, but in a European level at least, is the change in the balance of the relation of forces in our countries and in Europe. A wrong answer to a wrong question would be to confine our analysis in the national level. Because in this sense, we are playing the game of the neoliberals who are trying to present the crisis as isolated national problems and not as a structural systemic crisis of neoliberal capitalism. And at the same time, we are putting butter on the bread of the nationalists. And we help the neo-Nazis, the neo-fascists, the ultra-conservatives, the all kinds of fundamentalists to explode 
in the European political uh, scenery. The opposite side, we must not confine ourselves only in the European level. There are many German comrades, for example, that keep on asking us, what can we do as a sign of international solidarity to Greece? Change the relation of forces in your country. Yeah. Relieve yourselves, relieve yourselves and then Europe as a reflection from the austeritarian governments you have had in the last years. This is not an instant project. In Greece, there was a, an intensification of this process because of the social destruction. And it, it almost became true through one, in one month, but it had a background before it. All these general strikes, all these multiple initiatives. This period, there's a question, how to mobilize people in this direction? This period, we have been trying to build what we call networks of solidarity. These networks have two aims, an urgent one and a more strategic one. The urgent aim is to save the Greek people from destruction, to try to help them to survive, or to try to teach them, this is better, to try to learn through a participatory process how to help themselves to survive. So these networks of solidarity, which includes social pharmacies, social, uh, doc social medical exams uh, offered freely by volunteer doctors, uh, voluntary teachers that do tutoring for students whose families don't have the money to offer them tutoring, exchange of food, exchange of clothes and shoes, Exclaim, exchange of other consumer goods without the mediation of money. This is not philanthropy. It's a counter hegemon, it's a part of our counter hegemonic process. Philanthropy includes a vertical model. The one that has the powerful offers to the devastated ones who don't have and wait for the offer. No, we are trying to build an horizontal relationship in our local communities. And this is an ideological fight to give you the more strategic aim. Our societies have been trained in the last 35 years by the neoliberal dogma to be isolated in their house, on their sofa, watching the news of the opponent's media and not react to the destruction of their life. They have been trained to try to survive on the expense of their neighbor's life. This is what we're trying to change in practical terms, because in Greece the problem is there. People are dying and committing suicide. We are trying to convince the people to transform their personal problem, what they think that is personal problem, to a collective solution. Because unemployment is not a personal problem in Greece, and nowhere. It's a collective problem and can be answered only through a collective manner. This is both an urgent and a strategic fight, and it has to start here and now throughout Europe with the conditions that you think can be more inclusive for your own society, according to the specificities and the various different local, or regional, or national problems that your own societies face. I would like to close to my intervention. The need for European coordination is really urgent. In November, there's a meeting of the European social movements in Florence, in Italy, and in spring 2013, we're preparing, together with a lot of trade unions and social movements, a European alter summit, alternative summit, which will be held, hopefully, in Greece in May or June, we will see. There will be European calls. These are first signs, and the other important sign is that in the 14th of November, it is the first time in European history that three countries, Portugal, Spain, and Greece, are going on a general strike in the same day. And as a sign of this continuous struggle to change the relation of forces here and now, if our friends from the DGB or the other German trade unions cannot understand the necessity to join a general strike, maybe because it's forbidden to have a political strike in Germany, then we're expecting our German comrades to be on the streets in the same days with their own slogans 
to tax the rich, uh, to redistribute the wealth, and to express in this way, with their own fight, in their own country, the necessity of international solidarity. <laughs> and last but not least, Syriza is now the major opposition party with 27%. When Syriza was still in 4.5%, 4, 4, 4, 4 we opened the window. We made the public proposal to our people. We opened the perspective and the possibility and the proposal for a government of the left. There is an urgent necessity to create an autonomous, counter-hegemonic, socio-political project in our countries and Europe. We must start thinking, as I mentioned in the beginning of my last intervention, not based on the questions of the enemy. We must open new ways for the transformation of the society, and these new ways cannot be opened if we, are, if we stay trapped in the, in the continuous blackmailing of our national governments and the Troika.